One of the first places that many people start with the whole idea of white privilege is from this essay that was published in 1989, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. Now, the best way to understand this essay is it's kind of like a precursor to white fragility. It is a racist white lady talking about all of the privileges that she has just that she can observe over someone with darker skin. And you can see, I won't I won't read this essay, but you can just scroll through it. You can see she makes a list of things that she has as an advantage. And remember, this is in the late 1980s over people that have a darker skin tone. So she might say things like, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my own race most of the time. I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. I can turn on the television or open to the front page of any paper and see people of my race widely represented. I can use, whether I use checks, credit cards, or cash, I can count on my skin color not to work against me and the appearance of financial reliability. So things like this, she just makes a whole list of statements, never has any sources. You'll see that there are no sources in this particular essay. There's just notes on how to use the essay. And so it was basically her lived experiences of being a racist white lady coming out onto a piece of paper. Now, most people that I actually had to, this is one of the few woke things I had to do when I was studying psychology was read and write a little discussion response post to this essay, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. For me, I was very fortunate it stopped there. I didn't have to do a lot of the other woke stuff that a lot of other people have to do. But listen, one of the, the point I want to make with this essay is this, is that even though this essay has a lot of problems even though it does not have a foundation to stand on in regards to whether or not this was more than one person's lived experience, which is not how you measure lived experience, P.S., but that's another video for another day. All the problems with this, there was still the sense that, you know, this is just a phenomenon we're observing. White privilege in, in this particular essay was not seen as something that was inherently bad, inherently, like, problematic. It was just something that was observed and you could kind of work that into your factors of how you viewed your experience versus how other people view their experience. And Robin D'Angelo kind of does this in her book too, where she talks about how I am but a racist white lady because I was born and socialized into whiteness. But Robin D'Angelo in her book even says like, this isn't a bad thing. It just is what it is. It's it's not a shameful thing to be a racist. So they've been kind of playing with this idea for decades now that these things just are. They are just accepted. We should all just accept them. Don't don't get defensive. Don't cry those white woman's tears. Just accept these things as they are. It's just part of our experience of being socialized into whiteness as white people. But that's not the way things are anymore. And it's one of the things I thought of when I saw this tweet this morning from Chris Rufo. Scoop, the principal of East Side Community School in New York, sent white parents this tool for action, which tells them that they must become white traitors and then advocate for full white abolition. This is the new language of public education. I'm sorry, what? How did we go from, these are just things that we're observing that, you know, this is just part of being white, is accepting your white privilege. How did we go from that to, you have to become white traitors in order to be anti-racist? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Look at this. The eight white identities. White supremacist, white voyeurism, white privilege, white benefit, white confessional, white critical, white traitor, and white abolitionist. What in the world do these mean? Well, let's take a look. This is a, the eight white identities. There is a regime of whiteness, and there are action-oriented white identities. People who identify with whiteness are asked, are, are one of these people who identify identify with whiteness, okay, are one of these. It's about time we build our own ethnography of whiteness, since white people have been the ones writing about and governing others. And you'll notice others there is capitalized. So we start off with white supremacist. And of course, we can see 
So we're, we're in the danger zone over here, right? And what we want to do is get over into the green zone. This is the acceptable place for a white person to be. But we're going to start with the bad and work our way up to the good, apparently. White supremacist. Clearly marked white society that pervades names and values white superiority. Okay, well, I don't think I'm that, so I'm safe with that. White voyeurism. Wouldn't challenge a white supremacist. The, Dude, if you challenge an actual white supremacist to their face, you're a moron. You're asking the crap beat out of you. I'm sorry. I am not going to go. Like, I, I, like I, I have a big mouth, and I will run my mouth in a variety of circumstances. You know what I'm not going to do as a woman is go up to an actual white supremacist, an actual, like, member of the KKK or an actual Nazi, and, and challenge their inherent racism to their face. I'm going to get the crap beat out of me if I do that because I'm an idiot if I do that. Those people are angry, vile people. Why would I want to waste my time challenging those people when it's just going to result in me getting beat up? White voyeurish. So maybe, maybe I qualify as this. Won't challenge a white supremacist. Desires non-whiteness because it's interesting pleasurable seeks to control the consumption and appropriation of non-whiteness fascination with culture i.e consuming culture what the hell so white voyeurism which is like one step below being an a, an actual nazi is defined as consuming black culture without the burden of blackness within with one step up from the KKK, and we've already got, you're not allowed to consume black culture if you're not black. Okay. Number three, white privilege. May critique supremacy, but a deep investment in questions of fairness, equality, under the normalization of whiteness and the white rule. Sworn goal of diversity. Wow. White benefit. Okay, I think now we're getting up into the yellow section. Okay, we're, we're kind of getting into the, like, just warning section. Like, you're only, you're only partially, well, no, you're racist if you're all of these things, but you're, you're a little le less racist once we get up to number four. Sympathetic to a set of issues, but only privately. Won't speak or act in solidarity publicly because benefiting through whiteness in public some people of color in this category as well. Oh, oh, oh. So people of color can experience white benefit if they won't speak out and become little anti-racist. Okay. White confessional. Some exposure of whiteness takes place, but as a way of being accountable to people of color after. And you seek validation from people of color. You're probably requiring them to do emotional labor when they give you that validation. All right, now we're getting into number six. So now we're getting into the good te territory. So for all you white people out there, what you're striving to do is be white critical, white traitor, or white abolitionists. Let's see. White critical. Take on board critiques of whiteness and invest in exposing slash marketing the white regime. Refuses to be complicit with the regime. Whiteness speaking back to whiteness. So this is essentially an ally. You're a good little ally that calls out racism wherever you see it, even if that means you get the crap beat out of you by calling out an actual member of the KKK because you're a moron. White traitor actively refuses complicity. Names what's going on. Intention is to subvert the white authority and tell the truth at whatever cost. We need them to dismantle these institutions. And then white abolitionist, changing institutions, dismantling whiteness and not allowing whiteness to reassert itself. I don't even know. Like, I need more definition. Barner, Barner has, who wrote these, Barner, I need more definitions around specific actions. Because really, like, it's, it's mostly about the militancy, isn't it? It's mostly about the militancy with which you push back on your inherent racism. And this is what's being sent out to the children of white parents in a New York City school system. <sighs> I'm telling you guys, you got to get your kids out of the schools. Get your kids out of the schools. Get your kids out of the schools because this is crazy. It really is. If you need a good homeschooling research, The Reason We Learn is a YouTube channel. She talks about homeschooling all the time. She's a, she's a tutor. She works with homeschool kids. 
subscribe to The Reason We Learn on YouTube. She just passed a thousand subscribers. Deb will teach you how to homeschool your kids. And she's very adamant that everyone can do it and it's not as hard as you think. We've got to start getting kids out of the schools unless you want them to be programmed to become a white traitor when they're like, yay high. All right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, I do do content almost every single day around news, politics, culture, crazy social justice, woke stuff like this. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel, turning on notifications, leaving a comment and hey, leave a comment. Let me know where you stand on the scale of white supremacists to white abolitionists. I would love to know. I'm probably... I'm probably like way back here because I think that all of this is nonsense and that we should not buy into the fact that any of this is real because it's not. This is fantasy land right here. But leave a comment and let me know where you stand on this scale. That's all I've got for right now. I'll see you soon.